thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm Lars Hilliver at Cornell University, and I'm the moderator of today's panel. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, I wanted to uh, briefly tell you a little bit about CREST, our Conference on Reproducibility and Replicability in Economics and the Social Sciences. Uh, our goal is to provide a consistent series of discussions by specialists and practitioners on topics of reproducibility, replicability, and transparency, and other topics that intersect with that. Over the course of the next year, we'll have panels discussing educational, procedural barriers, slowing down adoption, whether journals or institutions or funders should be the verifiers of reproducibility, whether and how scientists work can be made to be more reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at inception and data collection. We'll be talking a bit about that today. So today we're joined by uh, three panelists who will help uh, us discuss the topic of reproducibility and ethics, which is more than just uh, IRBs. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Michelle and Meyer, uh, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of uh, uh, Bioethics and Decision Sciences at Geisinger Health System. I'm joined by uh, Shay Swager, Senior Researcher for Data Sharing and Ethics at the Future of Privacy Forum, and Sarah Copper, Associate Director of Research at JPAL Global. So I'm going to start with uh, Michelle. Um, so uh, reproducibility requires that others have access to potentially private data. Uh, on the other hand, IRBs are tasked with protecting research participants, including their privacy. Um, question to you, should IRBs be hostile to data sharing? Are there ways to share data that are consistent with or even advanced research ethics? Thanks, Lars. Um, so I think the, the brief answer is, um, research ethics and even the common rule is consistent, can be consistent with ethical uh, data sharing. So I'm going to give very brief remarks, first about um, some ethical reasons to share and second about um, some ethical ways of sharing or some ways of sharing more ethically. Um, so we start as we must in the US uh, with the US common rule. And so one might think, of course, that because IRBs and the common rule are tasked with protecting the interests and rights of research participants, that there is a tension or a hostility that's built into or natural to it compared to data sharing. Um, but it's actually a little bit more complicated. So what we see here is the text of uh, the common rule of a provision of the common rule. And this is one of several different things that an IRB must determine before it approves any uh, research study. Specifically, it must find that risks of a, sub of a particular study to subjects are reasonable in relation to anticipated benefits, if any, to subjects, and the importance of the knowledge that may reasonably be expected to result. So it turns out that vanishingly few social science studies offer any benefits to participants that IRBs will count. Um, read the article that's cited there from years ago where I complain about that, um, but for better or worse, mostly worse, IRBs have a very cramped understanding of benefit to participants. And so that is gonna be generally a zero on the ledger. As a result, any risks of social science research generally are gonna have to be justified by the knowledge that they produce for society. Arguably research that can't be reproduced or replicated shouldn't be considered scientific knowledge at all, much less important knowledge, however one defines that. That's a different top talk, I think. Um, and this broad principle uh, is sort of consistent with statements of many professional societies, the American Psychological Association, AER, but I'll go with the National Academies uh, who wrote, researchers have a fundamental obligation to create and maintain an accurate, accessible and permanent record of what they've done in sufficient detail for others to check and replicate their work. Um, okay, well, so much for professional societies and IRBs and a bunch of people who wrote the common rule. Um, ultimately, all of that is supposed to be, or at least the common rule and IRBs are supposed to be about the interests of research participants. So it seems pretty important to ask what they think about all of this. Uh, and we need more research is needed. Um, we need to know more. But I'll go through a couple of studies um, that suggest uh, some optimistic things about data sharing. So this is a study 
uh, done with participants who had just taken part in a low risk psychology judgment decision making study, and then were asked preferences about having those data shared. 93% rejected the idea that their data should be destroyed. 93% said it should be shared with others who want to verify the validity of scientific findings. And 97% uh, said it should be shared with people who actually want to test different research questions. Now, they were also asked to rank three different options, call this a robustness check, um, rank three different options for dealing with data, keeping it private, share it on request or share it publicly. Happily, the majority uh, supported sharing it publicly and openly. That is important relative to the option of sharing it on request because the latter really does quite poorly. So this study, which I don't have time to talk about, um, researchers asked hundreds of psychologists who had published in AP journals that required them to share data on request um, in order to reproduce the analyses. And they made those requests, sent over 400 emails in a duration of six months. And after all of that time and effort, they were only able to get data from 27% of the researchers and 26% of the studies. Um, so the boilerplate that we often see, sure, if you want the data, just ask me, I'll get, I'll get to it then, for lots of reasons we can talk about, isn't working well. Okay, well, that was low risk psychology research. What about higher risk? Um, well, this is taking us farther afield than the social sciences, um, but as I said, we have limited empirical data, so here we are. This reports participants' uh, views of data sharing who had taken part in clinical trials. Obviously, clinical trial data, usually health data, not necessarily benign. Many would view that as sensitive. Less than 8% of respondents felt that the negative consequences of data sharing outweighed the benefits. 93% themselves were very or somewhat likely to allow their own data um, from clinical trials to be shared with university scientists. A little bit lower, 82%. Um, when they were asked about sharing with scientists stationed at for-profit companies. Uh, their willingness to share didn't vary appreciably with the purpose for the sharing. And ironically, maybe, their greatest concerns about sharing were that other people would sort of be freaked out and would not want to participate in the research itself if sharing were part of it, which I do think is an important concern. Um, because ultimately we're here for the research, so we don't want to exacerbate selection biases, et cetera. Okay, finally, um, this is a small qualitative study of people's views about qualitative research data sharing, in particular sharing ex ex explicitly sensitive qualitative uh, data. And they too, on the mass, vast majority found, uh, supported that as long as their data were de-identified and shared only among researchers. Notably, participants hoped that their data would be shared and may have expected or assumed that this was already happening. And they trusted researchers and institutions to appropriately handle data sharing. Okay, um, that was a very non-exhaustive list of reasons why ethics should tell us we ought to be sharing at least as a default rule. Um, now here's a very non-exhaustive uh, discussion of ways to do that ethically, because of course, as with most things, uh, there are more or less ethical ways to do this. Uh, I discussed this at some length uh, a few years ago in this article, so I will generally refer you to a detailed discussion there, um, but I can highlight a few things. So a lot of this, honestly, I, I want to demystify it because a lot of people seem, oh, how, do, how can I possibly do this? What do I write in the consent form? It's not that hard. Just communicate with, they're just regular people. They're your research participants. Just communicate with them. Just tell them what you want to do and why. Um, but first, let's start with, so it comes down to planning ahead. First, let's start with what not to do. So don't say in your consent form that you're going to destroy data because it makes it super hard to share if it's destroyed. Um, don't promise not to share data also makes it hard to share if you promise someone, not impossible, but hard to share if you promise someone you won't share. Um, and comments like this, you know, only the study team will have access to your data. These are like zombie boilerplate phrases in, in research consents that just get sort of passed on. So we really have to be thoughtful about what we're saying and, and really scrutinize that and make sure that we're not um, offering this inappropriately. Don't limit the scope of research analyses. So again, your data will be used to study X. 
is not um, going to be helpful because that could be interpreted as a limiting clause. Your data will only be used to study X. And then beyond what not to do, of course, affirmatively do get consent to share. And part of this will entail probably telling participants a little bit about what is a data repository or archive, why is it important to share data, uh, who might have access to these data, for what purposes, and how, if at all, will their data be protected. If you're sharing it openly, you're not really protecting data, you're making a choice to share it openly. Um, I've already alluded to the situations that can happen when you collect consent, or, or sorry, you collect data under a consent that is either silent about sharing or explicitly promises not to share. And then after the fact, you think, uh-oh, my funder makes me share, the right thing to do is share, is to share, what do I do? That's tricky. See the article, or we can talk about it in Q&A. Um, uh, so a few more tips. You know, don't promise anonymity. Re-identification is a moving target. Um, experts don't know how to quantify the risk of, of re-identification, uh, and it can increase the more data sets about an individual exist in the world. Um, so a promise of anonymity is probably ill-advised. Do help make sharing the default at your institution. Encourage your IRBs. Most IRBs have consent form templates and IRB applications. Um, put in the applications, how do you plan on sharing data? With whom do you plan on sharing data? And not just during the study, like in the sense of collaborating with other external researchers, but after the study. Um, that's not something that every IRB thinks about um, or, or every researcher. And it's really helpful if they think about it in advance. Same thing with consent forms. You know, a lot of behavioral science has taught us that even if people want to do something, they won't do it if it's even a little bit hard or inconvenient, right? So if everyone has to reinvent their own data sharing consent form wheel, um, you're gonna get a lot less data sharing. So be the change you wanna see in the world, create these data sharing language templates, share them and encourage your IRB to have them be the template for everyone at your institution. Finally, recognize that data sharing decisions aren't binary. When privacy concerns um, or consent promises don't allow open sharing, uh, which is sometimes the case, consider other options. For example, controlled access with data use agreements. Um, there are protections that you can put in place that dramatically reduce risks uh, of privacy and can be consistent with ethics. Uh, and finally, just a couple of quick conclusions. So there are many good reasons to share data many good reasons to be thoughtful about how you share. Openness is an important value, but it's not the only one. Data sharing doesn't need to be in conflict with participant interests, but more research is needed uh, to better understand diverse participants' attitudes towards sharing diverse kinds of data. Data sharing should be the default and exception should be concretely justified. And that means not just, well, participant privacy, um, which I think too often can be used as a, a bit of a fig leaf for people who, for other reasons, don't want to share. So there really should be a, a, a real argument. And finally, researchers and IRB should plan for data sharing in advance to avoid thorny conflicts that arise between consent and data sharing desires later. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um... I have a few questions queued up, but now's not the time. So I'm going to uh, defer those to the to the Q&A. And in particular, um, I'm going to now uh, hand, and, and Sarah is going to put that up there, uh, over to Sarah Copper from, from JPAL, because JPAL recently announced a policy that all JPAL projects require approval from an IRB, such as those registered with uh, the Department um, of Health and Human Services in the US, even when the institution doesn't actually have such an IRB. So Michelle just talked about how you can get IRB approval. When do you actually want to think about some ethics approval when you don't have an IRB? Um, how did this policy emerge? Tell us about that. Thanks, Laura. So I think just to take a couple steps back and just explain a little bit about JPAL for those of you who aren't familiar with us, because I think this tees up the, the question that Lars posed. Um, so we're a research center that we're based at MIT in the US with seven regional offices around the world. Our network includes over 300 professors from over 50 universities. Um, to date, we've conducted over 1,100 RCTs in uh, economics in 93 countries. 
And so we we play a couple of roles in, in all of this work. We, we fund RCTs, we implement them through our regional offices, and then finally we disseminate the research um, through communications, uh, policies, policy briefs, um, blog posts, all, all kinds of things like that. So I think that the tension in a lot of our policies arise from the fact that JPAL is based at, in the U.S. at MIT, and we're, so we're subject to um, certain U.S. regulation, but we also work with a really diverse group of, of researchers, and we work in a very wide range of countries. Um, so, and of course, all of these researchers and, and all of the countries in which they're operating will have their own local requirements, some of which align with U.S. policy, some of which go further than U.S. policy, and some of which are kind of non-existent to some extent. So our, our solution historically to handle this um, was what were the JPAL research protocols. They are pretty minimal. They basically say, get IRB approval, do what the IRB approved you doing, submit amendments, and then just kind of follow them. And, and we trust you to, to be following everything that you said that you would. Um, these, these requirements apply to any project that we are funding or implementing. And then we also have some funding requirements um, that kind of touch on Michelle's points too, that say any project that JPEL funds needs to publish its data within three years of the project ending. Um, so I've put some examples of what these requirements are on the slide here. Um, so I, I think we, we don't want to supplant IRB review and, and certainly want to defer to the experts or to these well-established processes as much as possible. So in most cases, we simply acknowledge that we aren't ethicists, um, we aren't trained IRB members, and, and we just defer to the IRB in terms of review. Um, of course, there have been some exceptions, regardless of where the study is. So we have had instances of the IRB not wanting to review the research. Um, this is primarily because it's not happening um, at the university itself. The money isn't going to the university, and then the PIs involved in the project aren't actually accessing identified data. So the IRB has said, we don't want to have anything to do with this, um, and we have to come in and find some alternatives for the researchers. Um, I think another, another area where JPAL tends to be stricter than IRBs is in terms of pilots, um, be they research pilots or policy pilots, where most researchers may be able to argue successfully this isn't a research study yet, it's just feeding into a research study, um, but, but we come in and say, we, we require this review before we're able to give you any funding. Um, and then I think, again, recognizing differences in local contexts, we also encourage local review boards to complement whatever um, IRB is, is reviewing um, from the PI's host university. And then uh, about 18 months ago, um, we added this new requirement that any study that is written up as a summary and posted on the JPAL website must also have IRB approval. And this added a bit of complexity to, to our processes. And it led to some really um, philosophical questions as to what is an IRB? What is a review board that satisfies JPAL's requirements? What do we consider to be sufficient protection? Um, what, what sorts of review do we want the board to be doing? And if we are really deferring the review as much as possible to an IRB or to a review board, like how, how can we be confident that, that that board is meeting our standards? I think beyond these philosophical questions, there's of course the logistical questions of, okay, once we've decided what constitutes sufficient protection, how do we verify whether a board is actually providing that? So our, our solution, which is only a couple of weeks in the making so far, so I think we're, we're still in the pilot stage, um, is, as Lars mentioned, we require that the IRB be registered with the U.S. Department of Human Health and Services um, as an IRB organization or an IORG. Um, IORG status, it, it's, it's a simple registration process. It's not a form of accreditation by HHS. Um, it is a sort of a necessary step into obtaining um, an FWA. So it ensures that maybe the IRB at least exists. Um, and I guess here I'm using IRB and review board interchangeably, um, which is perhaps quite sort of indicative of the soul searching that we've been doing in this area. Um, and, and so the thinking here was, again, this is, um, it's a US requirement. It's not necessarily going to apply to review boards that are based outside of the US. 
but it does provide this, us this little bit of information about what the review board looks like. And the fact that they are able to go to the HHS website, um, fill out this form, give contact information, list out IRB members, at least tells us that there, there is probably something, a little bit some, of something there, and they aren't just going to be a rubber stamping sort of um, operation that is just trying to get people's money and, and check, off, check off a couple of boxes and let you go ahead. Um, I think the, the decision that, or the, the factors that led into this decision, I think one, as I mentioned, is that it's, it's really difficult for us as an organization to be able to conduct any kind of independent review as to whether an IR or whether a review board that is based in another country is actually conducting quality review. We could only really rely on the experiences of people who are trying to use that IRB. And that becomes pretty risky, um, especially if in terms of if you think about study timelines or what could possibly happen if, if things went wrong um, and people used a board that was not providing the right kind of review or had a really bad experience with one. Um, in terms of how this has affected the network so far, I think it's it's still early days, so we we are still in that pilot phase. Um, we're we're waiting to see what kinds of studies are going to be affected by it. We've given the the policy is effective for any study that is funded after October first. So there's a, a couple of studies that um, are in the pipeline but haven't yet had to follow this new requirement. Um, and then those that where data collection starts after January first. So I think we're going to start seeing the, the broader implications of this policy um, over the next couple of years. And, and we will use that to assess whether it's having, um, whether the, the additional hurdles are uh, proving uh, really detrimental to um, other goals of inclus uh, inclusivity in research and bringing in a, a broader set of researchers than those based in the US. Um, so I think recognizing that this particular policy is going to be much easier for US-based researchers to adhere to. Um, this is because all any US IRB is already registered with HHS, so it, it by default satisfies this requirement. Um, we've offered some alternatives to, to researchers, the main one being um, identifying commercial IRBs that do have expertise in reviewing international social science research. Um, a good example here is the IRB run by our sister organization, Innovations for Poverty Action. And then we will directly fund um, any of the, the costs that are associated with obtaining review from, from one of these IRBs. And alongside that, I think that there's this push towards really strengthening the review boards that are outside of the US. Um, as an example, we've worked with uh, review boards in a couple of places to, to get them set up, um, to help them follow best practices, to help them identify possible members to sit on them. Um, to get them registered with HHS and, and so on. And I think we're, we're really interested in pushing forward in, in ensuring that there is a, a strong group of local IRBs around the world that, um, that do provide sufficient protection and that we can verify based on our own experiences, based on our role in helping set them up and, and strengthening them, that they are providing the, the type of um, protection we, we want, as well as having this intimate knowledge of the local context. Um, and I'll just close by saying, I, I mean, I think the, the focus so far has really been on IRBs and on the institutional requirements. Um, I, of course, ethics doesn't end with IRBs. And I think a lot of these, these processes should be complementary. And, and as, as a large scale funder and implementer of RCTs, JPAL has a really important role to play here. So just to touch briefly on a couple of other areas that we're thinking about in terms of IRB or in terms of ethics that go far beyond these IRB requirements. Um, we hold annual trainings for staff, um, both internal trainings that are really specific to social science RCTs as, as well as um, sort of the typical city requirements. Um, we have some internal processes in place to review any projects that we are funding or implementing that don't even consider the IRB requirements, but rather rely on staff knowledge of the, the context in which the study will take place. Um, and so that we can take a step back and think, okay, this study, like maybe the IRB would sign off on this, but this actually doesn't, this seems like given what we know of this country or of, of this context, we think that there might be some issues in the current study design. 
Um, we One thing that we've been thinking about quite a bit over the past couple of years is uh, human subjects or people who are not covered by the IRB, so non-research non participants, and what sorts of processes and protocols we can put in place to ensure that they are safe and they are supported. Um, and then I think going back to Michelle's point too of um, ensuring that research data is protected um, where possible, sharing de-identified research data so that we can maximize the, the benefit of it to the research community um, and, and to the participants more broadly. So I will end here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I'll I'll bring this into a context that I come from in the journal space where this also shows up um, at, at the tail end. But I want to first have uh, Shia talk about something that I, I, I'm, I'm also interested in from the journal space to some extent. We see more and more data leakages. That's sort of da nearly daily news by now. And that's only the most prominent ones because if I go to the websites that list out all the data leakages, it's like hourly uh, activity there. Um, some of them have been used for investigative journalism and even academic research. The one most recent comes to mind are the Panama Papers. That uh, is just one quite prominent example. Um, for reproducibility, others need access to the data that was leaked to some extent, and that to some extent is legally acquired data. So there's a tension there between the benefit to society. Arguably, a lot of people think that the publications that came out of the Panama Papers, for instance, are beneficial to an overall greater justice, at least in terms of avoiding tax evasion and things like that. So there's a tension there, relating back to what Michelle said, there's a tension there between benefits from the research and the legal standing of those that have the data. And if you then convey them to others, how should we think about that? Um, so. Uh, over to you, Shay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shay Swagger. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, before I start, just shout out to my co-panelists, Dr. Copper, Dr. Meyer. Uh, plus one, I loved what you said. Those are super interesting. So I'm glad to be on this panel with you. Um, I want to back up a little bit to 2015. So uh, seven years ago. Jeez, that went fast. Um, there was a website called Ashley Madison. And probably familiar to a lot of you. Uh, it was a website dedicated to facilitating extramarital affairs. It got hacked. And the hackers uh, found out that Ashley Madison was not, in fact, deleting uh, account information like they said they did, like their whole you know business model was discretion. And the hackers are like, hey, you should do what you said you do. And if you don't, we're going to leak everything. And Ashley Madison didn't respond, didn't comply. And then the hackers leaked the entire user base and information. So like names, addresses, uh, IP, location, everything. So um, <clears throat> obviously the, the social fallout from this was horrendous. A lot of people uh, were harmed. So, you know, people lost their marriages, uh, several people lost their jobs. Uh, and there's been several documented accounts of self-harm, including people dying by suicide. So this is different than like a Wells Fargo breach. Like the, the, the harm here is different. And regardless of how you feel about the, the user population, um, a lot of people got hurt. Um, several researchers saw that this data set was public now and thought, geez, this is an amazing opportunity to be able to ask research questions that we would una unable to ask otherwise. So there was uh, you know, a couple of papers. One was on, is there a relationship between individual ethics and you know, corporate executive ethics? And they found, yes, there was. And there's other examinations of geospatial relationships. And you know, interesting, sure. But there was a lot of pushback around, is this an ethical use of public data? Because all of these publications were approved by IRB. And the common rule, that we're relying on to understand what you know ethical use of data says that if data is public, it's fine. And it doesn't matter if you do a mountain of crime to get that data public. If it's public, it's exempt. You don't have to review it. And there was a mountain of crime to do that. So criminality, legality, not relevant. Ethical, not relevant. Public, fine. Obviously, I think this is a glaring loophole for how we understand um, 
public data and, and what should be reviewed. And I want to argue that when researchers use public data from sources like these, it is the scholarly equivalent of revenge porn. If you're not familiar with what re revenge porn is, it's when someone either records themselves or with a partner, you know, pictures, videos, um, and then someone else without consent shares that. And it could be with friends, neighbors, colleagues, whoever, but often is uploaded to a platform. And so uh, the victim now has their nudes, not just with the person they thought they were sharing it with, but with a, a much broader community. And so like, let's say Pornhub, you know, it's a platform that tries to moderate against revenge porn, but can't catch everything. But all platforms like that work on engagement. So if a video is getting views, it's going to recommend that video to more people so that the more people that watch it, the more time is going to be recommended and it becomes a cycle of more engagement. So the people who watch revenge porn, while not morally equivalent as the person who perpetrated, are not morally neutral. I argue that they are in fact participating by compounding the harm of the original act. And there is a, an analogy to be drawn that the researchers, well, they weren't the hackers in the Ashley Madison link by writing in a peer reviewed article and citing the data, they are in fact elevating the number of people who would see that information had they done nothing. And so I think that we need to have a much bigger conversation, which we are here around what does informed consent look like when it comes to things like public data and hacks. And I want to say like Panama Papers, I wouldn't, I really don't care about billionaires and, and their consent when it comes to uh, sharing financial information. But I, I do care about some of these others. Um, IRB is an insufficient framework to understand the, the Ashley Madison hack. And there are a lot of others that have similar kinds of, of case studies. And so we need some other tools. And I wanted to share some tools that I find helpful when I'm thinking about ethical review for research. Uh, I hope that you find them helpful. Um, and then just some observations and, and uh, synthesis of some of those tools. So uh, the first tool that I really like is called intersectional feminism. So you've probably heard of feminism. Um, intersectional at the beginning is understanding how different multiply marginalized identities overlap and intersect to create an experience of oppression that might not be, or is in fact more than the sum of its parts. So you can be a woman, you can be black, being a black woman is going to be a different experience than just adding those together. And so intersectional feminism has a lot to say about consent, especially bodily autonomy. And there are incredible authors and theorists that I think we can draw from. Um, so second, I would say as a tool is queer theory. So the LGBT community has really nuanced um, and interesting, helpful frameworks and sort of the counter epistemologies and counter ontologies that can feed into our understanding of what informed consent looks like and what ethical research is. Uh, and the third is kind of two communities that I grouped together is uh, sex educators and the BDSM community. So we don't normally think of sex educators or BDSM as like, oh yeah, that's, that's how we inform our research. Uh, but I think that they have much better, more nuanced understanding of what consent is than most researchers ever get training for. So sex educators trying to teach people, especially like teens, how to have consensual sex. Um, it's much more than I got when, it, when uh, I went through high school. Um, consent has to have several elements and it has to happen in certain ways. And for the BDSM community, because the sex that they're engaging in has a higher risk of harm and there's more complexity as to uh, what consent looks like, they have a lot more nuance and practices that, are, that go beyond what we would normally consider informed consent. So I think those are really helpful communities. Um, so if you take all those communities together, there are two things that I think uh, we can point to as needed and helpful for IRB and informed consent. So the first one is that consent must be revocable. 
your yes can't mean yes if your no doesn't mean no. Um, you can decide to consent to sex and then in a few minutes change your mind at any point. And that has to be okay. You have to be able to stop. <clears throat> Research does this okay ish. Um, we have informed consent models where it is usually a, a piece of paper at the beginning of a study that says, you don't have to do this. You're not compelled to do this, or, you know, here are the risks. Um, and you can stop at any point usually. Okay, sure. But there's still sort of invisible power dynamics in the course of a study that study participants also often feel obligated to continue, or there's a sunk cost fallacy of, you know, I've already been doing this for X number of time, I'm, you know, I might as well finish. And so um, the one and done model of informed consent is not sufficient. And I think that sex ed and BDSM and queer theory and intersectional feminism talk about consent should always be revocable. And anything that's a barrier to uh, revocability needs to be addressed very explicitly and intentionally. <laughs> Second thing, um, consent should be ongoing. And there's kind of two other things that I would attach to that it should be dynamic and contextual. So um, when you're doing BDSM or when you're doing sex, sex education, um, that is something that we have to be consistently attuning to the context uh, and how it changes to the dynamic uh, of it. it. Has something changed in the room with the people? Um, and if we have an ongoing model versus a static one and done model, we're going to see a, a very different uh, kinds of participation and in a good way. And I think people are going to feel very differently about their experience having participated in research because of that in a positive way. <clears throat> so consent should be revocable and uh, ongoing, dynamic and contextual. And then uh, I'll wrap up with three general observations I have uh, about everything I've just said. So there are a lot of justifications that academia has given to ignore informed consent. Some of them have more merit than others, but all of them do not distribute risk and harm equally. So that the people that have the most risk of harm are usually the people that are most vulnerable already. So I'm talking women, children, LGBTQ people, people of color, non-binary, trans, they are usually suffering the brunt of risk and harm when we ignore consent. It's not the cis het, you know, neurotypical able-bodied white man that has power in an institution. That's usually not who risks anything when informed consent is taken away. So if we acknowledge that risk and harm are not distributed equally, um, then we should change some of how we're doing our practices. Uh, second thing, <clears throat> the Ashley Madison studies were largely done of convenience. Like the data was there and it would be really difficult to answer those questions um, had that not been there. But the convenience of researchers shouldn't trump the privacy and safety of the people that it's about. So if your research is really that important, you need to find another way. And if it's really that important, someone will fund you because it's so important. Uh, but your convenience is not an excuse to ignore someone's privacy or safety. Uh, and third and last, uh, I want to make a call to everyone here that we need to start prioritizing the well-being of the people that are most marginalized and powerless in our community over the interests of academic research institutions. Academia has a really long, horrible, and continuing history of things like eugenics and white supremacy and sexism and ableism. And we continue that through our research practices. And one of the ways that we can stop doing that is by introducing better models of informed consent into our practices. It is not sufficient. Like we need to we need to change a lot of other things too. But having a better model of informed consent is going to help us avoid continuing those harms and harming those communities. So thank you so much. I'm glad to be here and I'm hoping to have some Q&A with you. Thanks. Thanks, Shea. Um, I think on the last point, um, I actually want to say right over to, to Michelle uh, in terms of what should we actually, um, and 
for instance, who should decide on those, uh, the balancing of those benefits. That is the role of the IRB, but as we've pointed out, there are a few cases where um, IRBs are, at least by the common rule, not applicable. Um, Sarah has the point about, well, there's some commercial uh, or non-academic boards that one can refer to and ask them if you're gonna pay them some money, they're gonna do the task for even if IRBs don't. And how should we think about some of that? I know you've written about some of that as well. Yeah, so I, I, I take your question to be a broad one about, you know, what do we do about all these kind of loopholes in the common rule? And Shay talked about some and there are others, right? Um, and for sure, um, third party harm, for example, that's not built into the common rule, right? The common rule is focused on risks and harms to participants, but research can harm or put at risk third parties. And that's formally not part of the common rule. That's a problem. Um, uh, another one is sort of long-term consequences of research, how it's used in policy, et cetera, and, and research results can be abused. Um, I think these are really hard problems. And I'll be honest and say that I'm not sure that IRBs per se are the right bodies to fix them. Um, I, I wish I had a crisp, magical solution. Um, I guess I'd be smarter, probably not rich, but something if I had a crisp, magical solution to these problems. Um, you know, I think these are, are hard conversations. They're happening uh, all the time. And I think we need to come to consensus about them. Um, I'm not sure that there's an algorithm for them. And I I'm very sure that, or pretty sure that IRBs as they're currently constituted are not the right body to adjudicate these things. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop I mean, there. I mean, it takes sort of, IRB is a very institutionalized version of an ethics board if we want to take it more generally. And so monitoring of ethics, most universities will say, well, we're not funded for that. We're funded by the research and the research does that. Uh, JPL has decided that they're going to go beyond what just IRB and I wanted to put into context that it's not just a question of, well, you're doing research not in the US, which is also uh, often underprotected set of populations, which is precisely why I think JPL is doing some of that. Uh, speaking from my experience as, as a journal's data editor, I regularly get researchers who come to me and say, IRB waived their responsibility away because the data is public. For instance, FOIA data, right? You can get data on all sorts of things in the US through a Freedom of Information Act requests on the names of the police officers and the arrestees and their home addresses in both of those cases where we might say, well, that's legal. And IRB will wave their hands and say it's public, but we might feel uncomfortable actually publishing that data. And yet we want to make it available to others in some ethical way so that the, the science can actually do its job and, and move forward with that, assuming that that science has been deemed appropriate to, to go forward anyway as ethical science. Um, where can researchers these days, if, they, if, if they're asking an ethical question that an IRB is, says it's out of scope uh, as defined by the common rule, what options do they have? Well, so um, one option is a, a research ethics advisory or research ethics consultation service, which certainly doesn't exist in every institution. It does exist in many, many academic medical centers um, uh, for various reasons having to do with NIH. Um, and so, you know, there are certainly there are research ethicists and pretty much all research ethicists acknowledge that ethics is much broader than what the common rule says or what any particular code says. So there are people who whose job it is to think about these things. Um, you know, ethics is not a science and there's always going to be disagreement and contentiousness, um, but there are experts to ask and one hopes. I think a lot of people are generous actually with their time too, even if you don't have an in-house research ethicist in your organization or a formal uh -huh. consulting service. I, I not, <laughs> please, don't, please don't send me many, many, many emails, <laughs> um, but spread the love among my colleagues. But I mean, really there are, uh, you know, that, that, that is a resource. Um, and of course there is a literature, this is actually a field 
research ethics is actually an academic yeah. field. So there, there are whole journals, believe it or not, devoted to this. So, you know, start with a, literally start with a, a literature review, start with a PubMed search or, or a Google Scholar search or whatever. Um, yeah, um, go ahead, Sarah, sorry. Yeah, if I can jump in from the social science perspective too, I mean, I like strongly, strongly agree with Michelle that I think IRB should not be thought of as ethical review. It's not, it's not that you get IRB approval and like, okay, a blank check, my study is ethical. I can do what I, what I want now. It's, it should be completely independent of your own assessment of your study protocols and, and your own like view of whether, whether what you think is doing is ethical, what thinking, learning what you can about the context in which it's happening, thinking about participants and non-participants and, and what effects there might be. My personal experience is that there, as Michelle said, there are people, ethicists are really, really happy to talk about these issues on a one-off basis or an ongoing basis and in, in the social sciences um, too. So I'm not, I'm not trying to volunteer you, Michelle, for, for these things. But, um, and I think there's, especially in the social sciences too, where, where I'm at least familiar with what's happening, I think people are thinking about this and they are looking for frameworks and looking for discussion with other researchers and so there's there is a lot of opportunity for discussion, um, both with people who have worked in that context and those who are just having these same kind of ethical questions in the studies that they're running. Um, I thought I'd never say these two abbreviations in the same sentence, but uh, it seems like what Shea you were saying about BDSM and the ability to withdraw consent is actually embodied to some extent in the GDPR's rule right to delete, um, which goes beyond just the collection of, of data. Uh, but also to the data distribution or the, the, the databases that have that data in that. Uh, essentially, uh, Ashley Madison did definitely infringe on the GDPR as well. Um, has that in sort of your work with the Future Privacy Forum helped move this discussion forward? I know lots of researchers complain about that research has become much more difficult or at least many more boxes to check in presence of the GDPR. Um, is that a good thing? I don't know. I mean, I so I have really smart colleagues that I work with that understand GDPR enormously better than I do. So I can't speak to that. But I, I do think that there's some overlap there uh, around right to be forgotten and right to delete. Um, I don't know if I could say more, but I am happy that you are now able to say BDSM and GDPR in the same <laughs> sentence. I think that's a win for everybody here. Um. So um, I'm, I'm a data editor at a journal. Um, who should journal editors who make these decisions on a regular basis, I can assure you about, should we actually be publishing this research that's coming to our door at various stages, at acceptance of the journal, or when somebody like a data editor tells them, hey, you know, actually this data, um, there, there, there might be a question mark, or we get uh, questions about that. Is that something that, um, editors might decide as a group or is uh should we then go out and and talk to um michelle meyer and all her clones uh as as a committee um question to my panel um what should data editors do what's your what's your suggestion to them i i have gotten occasionally requests from editors to do an ethics review of a manuscript where a manuscript has presented a problem that has troubled an editor. Um, and, you know, nature, the Nature Springer family of journals has recently announced a much broader ethics um, policy having to do with human subjects and how they're described and much broader than, than IRB. Um, and I'm not I'm not certain, but I, I've heard rumors that there may be some sort of committee that they're gathering to, to sort of implement that policy. Um, so that's certainly having ethics advisors, you know, on your editorial board is certainly reasonable. Um, I think over time, the goal should be for the editors to sort of absorb some of this knowledge and have a, a, a policy or guidelines that are internal um, and as you learn more, you iterate on those policies and um, as times change too, because this is normative and, and norms change and our understanding of our understanding of what when something is or isn't public is not a fixed, that is a fluid 
concept, for example. So over time, um, you know, I think you, you iterate and, and that can be your kind of North star and then occasionally bump it up against, you know, experts in the field. And is this still make sense? Yep. Okay, great. Let's keep going. Yeah. I mean, editorial boards also evolve over time. So, I mean, it's not like the vast majority of, of research is ethically ambiguous. So uh, you're going to hit a few cases over the lifetime as an editor, and then you rotate off and you have to build that knowledge again, which is where I see the attraction of potentially having some explicit ethical representation on the board. Um, but yeah. Uh, let me switch topics to informed consent. Uh, we also have a question uh, from the audience from Maria Jones at the World Bank about um, how to improve informed consent in practice. And, and Michelle, you also started out with, with some, some guidance on that. Um, I mean, at some level, um, and I remember uh, researching at some point in time how people perceive privacy when you actually ask them that question as, uh, you know, if I promise you as a participant greater privacy um, in various ways, uh, the classical uh, randomized response experiment, and then you actually ask people, you actually run experiments with that, um, you spend a huge amount of time explaining it to them, and then it doesn't matter a whole lot in the end. Um, Michelle, you said that there isn't a huge amount of, re of, of known research that actually investigates that. If my, if my informed consent is longer than my actual uh, questionnaire, um, I have a problem. So where's the right balance between default solutions, appropriately well-designed informed consent and the patience of the participant, um, how, how do we balance that? The question to, to all of you who sort of face this, uh, but maybe uh, Michelle or, or Shay uh, to start off with. So there's, um, there's actually quite a bit of emerging empirical evidence about informedness and how to increase it. I mean, informedness and, conform and consent forms are a disaster. Um, the consent form is not where it's at. It's the consent process and it's the dynamic. Um, so I have done some research, uh, not yet published, that uses concepts that I am not, can't take credit for. Things like teach back questions. So you can... Um, present some information to pr prospective participants and then more or less immediately ask them some simple questions to ensure their understanding. And the, the goal is not to like stratify your population on a curve and separate the wheat from the chaff or anything or to trick them or anything like that. Um, it's simply to try to help them understand. It, it's, you know, often we try to remove friction I'm, I'm stealing this from John Wilbanks. Um, you can, he's amazing and you should Google him if you don't know who he is. Um, often we try to reduce friction from processes. Consent is something where we actually want to throw a little bit of sand in the gears. We want to slow people down. We want to engage their type two system. We, we, we want them to be a little bit deliberate. Um, and so these teach back questions serve that, that, that function. Um, and you can actually quiz them again. So I'm doing a big... I'm part of a big um, project now where we're collecting a lot of data from people. It's a social science project and the data, some of the data are sensitive and we want to make really sure that people know what they're signing up for. Uh, and so we are asking them these questions along the, during the consent process. And then we're asking them again, and we actually have a threshold for passing. Um, so that's that's one tool. I mean, needless to say, readability and different language and explaining things in a few different ways. Um, um, but but it is hard. It's it's really hard because people's attention spans are not, including mine, are not long. <laughs> uh, I want to second the the shout out to John Wilbanks. I think that uh, from the last time I checked in on their work, they were at Sage Bio Networks and they were doing really good work on informed consent. I think they've got some stuff you can access. Um, I will also add that I think that we need more uh, researchers from HCI and UX, so it's human computer interaction and user experience or design, um, because text-based informed consent sucks. Um, it is not fun to read. It almost feels like a punishment, like a, a hoop you have to get through. And so I've seen lots of different interfaces that people are proposing that have shown uh, to be effective and, and not only just communicating what the content is, but the users have an easier time understanding and consenting to either certain parts. So it can be, I consent to A, B, but not C. Um, 
So there, there are definitely newer models coming from UX and HCI that are changing what informed consent looks like. So it's not longer than the actual questionnaire. Um, but I, I agree with everything uh, that you said as well. One of the other tools that Sage Bionetworks uses, they call tiers of information architecture. And it just means people have different informational needs. So there's a threshold, a floor of what kind of everyone needs to know for IRB reasons and other reasons. But beyond that, some people wanna double click literally and read more about something. And so in the, in sort of e-consent, if it's not a 30 page you know, static document, if it's e-consent, it can be more dynamic and can be more interactive. You can have learn more links, uh, and so that that's some of the tools that that we've been using tool, and of course videos and all kinds of things. Um, maybe one last question before we need to wrap it up. Um, how about consent that actually differs enormously across people? One person who says just put all my information, including my name, online, and the other one who says I'm going to give you my my uh, my self declared gender, but not the income, and I want total protection within the same surveys. That may be a solution. Maybe, but it's really hard to do research that way. Oh, I, I, I don't uh, disagree with that. So, because <laughs> I've been thinking about that question but for. You, you, a long time. I mean, we said earlier that it shouldn't just be the researchers' needs driving it. So, yeah, yeah, of course, it's way more difficult to do that. But so maybe it's something to explore. Different. Yeah, publishing is difficult. Like we, we the, the mechanisms to do that literally don't exist to do it well, like all the way through the research life cycle. They're not there. Uh, I definitely believe that we can make them if we have an investment. Um, and I'm talking like lots and lots of money. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's worth it. It is going to be really hard though. And I don't want to like short sell that like, oh yeah, we can knock this out in a few months. It's it's a, it's a paper or two away. It's difficult, <laughs> but it's very important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to need to wrap this up. Um, but any last words from anybody? Thanks for organizing. Okay, uh, then I thank you for coming. This was uh, very interesting. Um, as usual, we've run out of time and we need more time. Um, but uh, thank you very much for for uh, for being here. Uh, thank you for all the attendees for uh, attending and for asking the questions. Um, our next session uh, in the series is on November 20th, actually in person. And as far as we can tell, we can't make it available hybrid. Uh, so please do come by the Southern Economic Association's meetings in Fort Lauderdale, where we'll be talking about reproducibility as part of undergraduate education and the curriculum. Um, I'm almost certain we'll reprise that session sometime later online and we'll try and record it. Uh, we're back online for an online only session on December 13th at an earlier time, 1215 Eastern, when we discuss uh, reproducibility and confidential and proprietary data um, that of course intersects as many of these things do with some of the things we said here, there, there we ask the question, can it be done? Um, and the focus there being on reproducibility. Uh, the short answer is yes, it can be done, but we'll discuss that there. So as always, our website, uh, which should have been posted, you guys found your way here uh, by the website. So uh, register, uh, we've put all the registration links in there and thank you all for coming.